Hi everyone. So today I'm going to talk about Oracle Open Data and how it is helping researchers and developer collaborate by making data more understandable and consumable. So today's agenda is why large scientific data sets are important, how the research community is collaborating today, what are the typical challenges they face during collaboration, and how Oracle Open Data tries to solve it. There is a phrase that says, data is the new oil. A lot of companies have untapped assets called data, which have been collected and stored for decades. Unlike oil, data is an infinite resource that's being created every second of the day. Data as an asset can be very useful for a very long time. Today, every company sees data's fundamental value. Information must be extracted to reap its rewards. No wonder there is a huge surge in jobs like data scientists, data analysts, data engineers, etc. Let me pick a specific example of Earth observation data. Previously, countries and now companies have been launching hundreds of satellites every year and capturing various types of images of specific geographical regions, specific resources like ocean, polar ice caps, etc. These images are captured every minute. Within this petabytes of data lies answers to questions like agricultural yields, deforestation, mining rates, climate change, and other things that might impact economy, social life, and vegetation. So what is driving the need for these large data sets? If you think about today's startup ecosystem, almost everyone has access to every kind of technology out there, like frameworks, languages, tools, etc. For scaling, everyone has access to cloud technologies like infra as a service, platform as a service, which can help scale their applications. Today, state-of-the-art algorithms, neural networks are available to everyone. Even pre-trained models are open sourced or exposed as APIs. So what is the differentiating factor? What about data? Data in any form is good, but having a clean, curated, labeled and targeted data is a gold mine. For example, 1000 hours of English voice data of a particular accent or a million conversational text of a specific region. So companies are building applications to collect more and more data and make sense of it. Another trend that has brought focus towards requirement of large data sets are the data-hungry deep learning algorithms. AI, ML, and analytics is actually showing us the real value of data and providing businesses competitive advantage. Today, every application you see around has some form of AI in it. If you want to book a cab, you open up an app, which is able to find the shortest route, nearest cab, cheapest fare, and help you share rights. AI has become part of our daily lives, be it health tracking, sleep monitoring, managing your diet. It has also helped us automate a lot of jobs. Today, most of the conversations are handled by AI powered conversational agents that are helping us write better essays, help doctors diagnose ailments. Bottom line is, Data is the fuel that drives all AI algorithms. So a lot of research papers are being published every year by the research community. As per the National Science Board, there were around 2.5 million papers published across the world in 2018 in all domains. What does this mean? This means researchers are actively proposing new architecture algorithms and building new data sets. 
For every research, data is the fuel. There is a phrase, garbage in, garbage out. This is probably the first lesson every data scientist learns. Machine learning methods and algorithms are highly dependent on the quality of data. And in any data science life cycle, a data scientist spends around 70 to 70% of his time acquiring data and making it consumable at scale. Let us look at a typical scenario where a researcher can bring in data onto his machine or even generate data, process it and publish the research. Next, they push data to some repository and share the links so that other researchers can consume it, reproduce results and start building on their research. Well, it's not so simple. Today, data is stored in multiple places. It might be a remote drive, a Git repository, a object store, or hosted as a web link. Data sources are not standard. This makes searching and downloading data cumbersome. It also causes a lot of confusion around the authenticity of data source. Depending on the problem we are trying to solve, the volume of data can vary from a few gigabytes to terabytes. For example, the image data from satellites will be in terabytes, whereas a simple image classification data might be only a few gigabytes. Data has variety of formats. It might be image, video, text, audio. And these in turn can have sub formats like images might be JPEG, PNG, videos can be MP4 movie files, text can be JSON XMLs. This can get complex pretty soon. Then there are other types of complex data formats like geospatial data, genome sequencing, pharmaceutical chemistry, so on and so forth. The variety of data formats have a very broad spectrum. Some of the data sets might be updated very frequently like the geospatial data, which is updated every five minutes or so. Whereas some data sets are updated once a month or when a new research comes out. Someone has to keep track of this so that people who are working on this data get the right updated versions. The authenticity of the data source, the quality of data and the availability of data is very important. We need to make sure the data we are using to train our models are safe and doesn't contain any malware. Let me talk about tools and technology problems that the researchers face, which consume a lot of their time. Let's assume there is 24 terabytes data hosted in US by a researcher. If another researcher in Japan wants to use the data, does he have to move the entire data? Does he have the necessary hardware? Can we download subset of data? Let's assume you're building a fake news detector application. Common crawl data is around 400 to 800 GB based on what format you download. But you are interested in articles only related to news. How do we do it? Is the data searchable? Let's assume for your research, you need only female voice files from Libri speech. Instead of downloading 100 GB of all data, can you download only files related to female voice? Licensing and terms of use is another big problem. Depending on the licensing terms, you may or may not be able to use the data set. Furthermore, you might have combined multiple data sets and all have their own licenses. It is the responsibility of the end user to understand what they are doing. It can get complicated pretty soon. The producers of the data are required to write up documentation, take care of the versioning, licensing, and scaling only if they choose to do so. The consumers are experts in their domains, but now they also have to be experts in the tools and technologies used 
to do research on this data. For example, assume I am a biologist or a, looking to do some kind of vaccine discovery. Not only do I need to be an expert in understanding how to produce the best vaccine, but I also need to be an expert in scaling and technical consumption of the data. Data tends to be treated as a separate and independent entity. We at Oracle Research treat data as a first-class citizen and take an integrated and holistic approach. We believe the answer is finding a way to manage large data sets so that it's easily distributed, have all the great documentation, versioning, usage information to consume the data in a way that makes sense. Once we publish data to our repository, one of the output is the data itself, but that's not necessarily sufficient. Regardless of the size, what we guarantee is that we are providing cataloging, a good dictionary, able to search and scale, provide usage examples, and all the collateral necessary to understand and use data. We want to integrate deeper code and tooling examples for consumption and reproducibility. Sample code that shows how to load the data for analysis, tools for visualization of data, deeper integration to data labeling tools, capability to spin up CPU and GPU servers based on the size of data, all at one place. We want to enable third-party data onboarding. We know that a lot of institutions are providing important and relevant data sets. We want to make sure that we can redistribute these data sets. We focus on providing fully documented data sets with per record level metadata and tracking the versions of the data for reproducible results. Let me walk you through our open data cloud service. So this is the homepage of our Oracle Open Data Cloud Service. So let me go to a place where all our data is hosted. Oracle Open Data focuses on data sets spanning from genomics to bioinformatics, geospatial to earth science, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Currently, Oracle is only the only cloud provider to offer access to new Zinc 22 dataset and which enables virtual screening of millions of commercially available molecules. Here you can see all the data set hosted by categories. And these categories and data sets will keep growing. Let me select one specific data set and dive deep into more details. There are a couple of things that I'd like to highlight. First of all, we provide a very high level information about the data, like who is the owner of the data, what is the size of the data, what is the licensing type, and what are the number of files. Though you can see this data is only 15 GB, it has more than 100,000 files that needs to be processed. So if someone chooses to use it, they have to think on how to process these files and what kind of hardware they need to spin up. We offer data in a technology platform and protocol that makes sense and is accessible by tools and technologies. HTTP is one such protocol that's been there for quite a long time and most new and legacy software system can deal with it. We also provide search features and are constantly evolving it. So when you're looking at a data set, which has over 100,000 files, probably you want to download only subset of record. Currently we have search based on the name of the file and the size of the file. So if I select size and provide 100, it just filters out all the files that are around 100 KB. So as we constantly evolve our metadata, we will be able to do more interesting searches. Like for a genome sequencing data, you will be able to see gender of the species, age, 
and for a geospatial data you might be able to see the location and the resource type furthermore i would like to talk about the section that where there is integration for tools and sample code the sample code lies and lives with the data typically what we see today is people provide example articles or github repos these things quickly become stale references to the data we consolidate all these things to a single system so that all the collateral evolve with the data we will be able to use this ready to run examples on any platform regardless whether it's your laptop cloud etc we also keep curating related links and articles be it website blog or other additional collateral that helps explain how the data was curated how it is being used and how others are thinking about the data so one thing i want to uh, point out here is all the data sets are in oracle open data are located very close to our compute resources including oracle high performance computing and cpus this reduces the cost and time to move and use the data and we are also providing deeper integration to oci data science and ai ecosystem and sample code for every data set which simplifies technical complexities and makes it easy for researchers to focus on its strengths let's talk about a typical scenario let me open our oci cloud console So let's assume one of the research institution provided just x-rays of people around the world. It might be labeled or not based on the data provider. What we know is the data hosted in Oracle Open Data is authentic and has gone through all security checks. Now we have to label our data. So we can go to our, our data labeling service. and create a new data set and creating new data sets for labeling is very simple first you just have to provide a name of the data set and description the description are like x rays or like just x rays and labeling instruction is uh, let's do a simple classification so uh, label it covid or normal then we are going to select images since we are labeling images and for this exercise we are going to use a single label so the particular image would either be a covid image or a normal image so after providing all this relevant information we click next and we can load the data directly from oracle open data object storage where all the data is hosted then you are going to provide the bucket name where the labeled data is going to get stored back for your analysis and model building for now and you are also going to provide what are the labels so you'll say okay the two labels the images have to be labeled are covid and normal and once you cl click next and complete this a new project would be created for the sake of time i'm going to cancel this since i've already created this project and i'm going to walk you through that 
So I've created the project which I've showed you. So now I'm going to show you how easy it is to label our data and export it into a bucket. So this is one of the just accuracy which has not been labeled. So you can either label it uh, COVID or normal. So a domain expert would be uh, labeling this. So we'll go next. So. So this is done. So we have done labeling all our images. So we do save and done. And now we can export this, this label data set into multiple formats. Since I've done a simple classification, we are going to export it as a JSON L format. But if you are doing bounding box kind of labeling or multi-class classification labeling, you can also export it into other standard formats like YOLO, COCO, et cetera. So once the labeling is done, the next part would be the analysis. So let me open our Oracle notebook service. So when we are, once we are opening our Oracle notebook service, it gives the option to the user to spin up different kinds of compute instances, whether he wants a CPU or a GPU, and what is the size of the RAM, and a lot of other configurations. It also provides pre-built environments, which has all the necessary libraries installed. So these are all the pre-built environment that are available. So based on what you're doing, you're doing a financial analysis, or you're doing some machine learning on Oracle database, or you're going to use a spy spark. So there are all the necessary information and libraries installed. But you also can build in your own Conda environments when you have your own favorite libraries to bring in. So once you have launched this uh, notebook instance, which I've already created. So here I'm going to show you an end-to-end -end pipeline of how easy it is to build a modeling by using Oracle open data. So these are just standard code. You just have to provide relevant information. So once I execute this, I can see all the projects available in my labeling service. So this is what you can see in our labeling service. If you go back to our data labeling list, you can see these are the projects that are available and this is the one which we created just now. So once I execute this value saying, okay, list all the data available in this particular data ID, it says, okay, none of the labels or the images were labeled. But after you label and export it, you will see for each label, there are certain annotations, whether it is COVID or normal, et cetera. So once the labeling is done, the favorite part of the data scientist or a data analyst begins because now we will start writing the data into various folders based on how we want to design his modeling. He is going to write it to train and validation folders or test folders, it can be anything. He might want to visualize certain files and see whether the files are loading properly. properly. This is just a sample code to see whether the chest x-rays are loaded. So once this is done, this is what researchers love to do and also are expert in doing. So they love to do feature engineering, create different kinds of features out of images, maybe scaling, cropping, flipping. There are various image transformation techniques they are going to use and create different features. Then they are going to build models. They can build simple CNN models. They are going to build, uh, they might use transfer learning to and uh, build models using inception net or VGG net. And then they do model evaluation. They have an evaluation criteria on which they are trying to optimize. So once the model validation is done, they keep repeating this experiment until the objective is met. So here I have just created a simple 
CNN classifier. It's a very simple CNN classifier. And I've given a loss function. So after this, I have scaled the image to an appropriate image size. I'm bringing all the image to a certain size. I've not done a lot of transformation. Then you're going to do model.fit. This is where the training is going to happen. And this is what the data scientist could do. He, he would do a lot of experimentations and figure out the right hyperparameters. So once this is done and the model is generated and he's satisfied with his evaluation criteria, he writes the model to a file system. So after this, the non-trivial engineering part starts in which a data scientist is not very expert in. Those things are how to store this model so that it can be used by all other uh, module owners or the other data scientists, or how to serve this model so that it can be uh, used for testing or, uh, or beta releases, how to scale the model. When there are a lot of traffic coming in, how to make sure this uh, our serving code can scale and how to monitor models. These are non-trivial tasks that a data scientist is not expert in. So in order to do this, we have a lot of, it, it looks like we have to write a lot of code, but most of the code is like templates, template based. You just have to provide the right information. So first thing is you would want to create or package the model. So you have, you have written the model into a model directory. Now you want to package this model with the environment. The environment contain all the libraries that are required to run this model. So this is the code that is used to package the model that is available in our Oracle data science library. So you just have to provide the model name, the path to which you wrote the model and the environment name that has to be bundled with this model. So after this, now you want a code for prediction. So the code for prediction also is very simple. There are two functions you just have to implement that is load model and predict. You just have to implement your functionality within these functions and that's it. So once this is done, now you are ready to push the model to the model store and to serve the model. So this is the template code that is used to push the model into the model artifactory. You just give a name of the project and some uh, reader friendly description. And once you push this, it stores the model into something called our model catalog. And it provides all the metadata information for you. Like what was the model, what's the description and what is the environment that it used to save with this model and things like that. So we can go to our data science console and see where the model, whether the model has been stored. So if you go to a data science uh, project and if you go to models, here we have this COVID-19 model stored. So now this model is stored and it can be used by anyone, even outside Oracle environment to deploy these models since it is independent and packaged with the virtual environment and everything. So the next logical step after storing the model would be serving the model. Even to serve a model, you don't have to worry much about this code because all this code is like a template based code. You have to just provide certain details like the model ID, which you get from the output here, or you can get from the cloud console, the type of instances. During training, you might have spun up a GPU in order to train faster. But for serving, you feel that CPUs are sufficient to save cost. So you will tell what type of instance you want. Then you'll tell the number of instances. Probably you're serving this model to a beta users and, and you think, okay, I need five instances on which this model has to be served. So you select the number of instances, then the bandwidth of your load balancing. So you might think that people might post high definition images. So probably the bandwidth I would require is around 500 to 600 Mbps. So based on your choice, you're just going to specify the model ID, the shape of the instance, the number of instances and the load balances bandwidth. So once you have done this, 
you can run this particular code to deploy the model into our model serving environment. This code here is just giving a proper display name, a description, and other boilerplates code. So once this particular deployment is done, we can go to our model deployments and see there is a COVID-19 classifier that has been deployed. So the next step after the deployment would be to understand how to invoke this model. So if you go to invoking model, you can see various information like the HTTP endpoint of our predict API. If you want to invoke it through CLI, you can use this code. If you want to invoke it through or integrate it into your Python application, you can use this. And there is also a Java SDK. So what I have done is I have just loaded up a sample image from the directory and I'm going to authenticate the resource principle. This is the endpoint that I've copied from the Oracle Cloud Console. And now when I execute this, it predicts, it predicts something. It might be a COVID X-ray or a non-COVID X-ray based on how we have done your training and things like that. So what is important here is to see how easy it is to go from data lying in Oracle open data to the entire ML lifecycle and hosting it to your users. So we are going to provide these kind of integration directly to our Oracle data science services so that the data scientist or the researcher can focus more on his ablation experiments rather than thinking about other tools and technologies. So uh, coming back to our uh, presentation, so there are a lot of initiatives and incentives Oracle Open Data or Oracle for Research is offering. So Oracle offers many program focused towards different groups. For everyone, we offer $1,000 in cloud credit and some always available free services. For startups, we provide startup accelerator benefits plus free services and cloud credits up to half a million dollars. For researchers, we have Oracle for Research Project Awards, which also provide large grants for paper submissions and one-on-one -on -one support. We have specialized research fellow programs, which offers $100,000 in funding for your research. So please do utilize all these things. So there is a lot of interest and interesting data out there. As developers and researchers, let us know what data sets you would like to see hosted on our Oracle Open Data. If you are a data provider and you want to host your data for free, write back to us. We can help you host your data. We would love to hear from the community their suggestions on how to better collaborate with data. Reach out to us and our team at Oracle Open Data underscore dub dub at the rate oracle.com. So thanks everyone for your time. I will open up the forum for questions. Avinash, uh, there are a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The model and algorithm used. Okay, there are ML specific questions, Avinash. Okay. Yeah. Can you share me the email ID used to sign up with? Okay, so it's in the Q and A section. Okay, you did yes. Yeah, one second. Let me go. What of models and algorithms? You so uh, I have used a simple uh, CNN model. So the goal of this experiment was to show how easy it is to build the entire end-to-end -end ML pipeline rather than focusing on the algorithms. You can bring in your old algorithms or you can use pre-trained models. Everything is possible. You can actually go through our Oracle uh, data science library, which 
shows you a lot of examples and we also have a github with all these examples so that would be a very good starting point so right now i have, I have used a simple cnn model so the next question is would the classifier deployment also show up in my compute instance on cloud console absolutely so whatever classifier you have deployed it will show up in your cloud console and you can also collect all the metrics like who is hitting your uh, uh, load balancers how much traffic is coming uh, how much bandwidth you have to set and everything everything will be available do you have to copy the url of the model deployment manually or can that be retrieved automatically through yes it can be retrieved through uh, api calls when you start using our uh, sdks you will be able to do it for the demo perspective since i have to do a simple post call from my notebook i just copied the uh, url so please talk more about the sdk for invoking the model oh, okay so there will be a different session for who is going to talk about the sdk oracle's data science sdk i would not be the uh, right person to talk about it there are both python sdks and java sdks uh, as per my knowledge but javascript sdks and other things i think uh, that team would be the right uh, right person to talk about that so sagar has a question yeah sagar would you like to uh, pose your question sagar okay while training we did some image transformation such as rotation fix size etc while consuming the model the new data has to go through the transformation do we have that automated or the end user has to know to do it so yeah okay it, the example i showed you was a very uh, simple example so one second so there are two things either the user the user doesn't don't have to know what kind of transformation is happening what you can do is if you think okay they are going to post raw images when you are implementing your predict functionality you can do the transformation here and then feed it to your model i am just taking it and putting it to my model here but you can also do those transformation and then ask your model to predict on the transformed output that is possible so yeah sagar uh, does that answer your question okay uh, in the pyday event i will have to figure that out um i will uh, let you know i'll figure this out and i'll let you know i don't remember on top of my head so so can you please unmute me yeah how can you please unmute sagar i don't know sagar this hey, uh, yeah is there a way to unmute mm -hmm. participants okay uh here there is one more question uh, this is a demo session as okay chain has already answered it there is no lab portion for that but you can uh, download this notebook and try it on your when you open your free account you can try it out there we are going to provide the links to github where we we are going to upload this code so mm. so uh sagar uh, actually i'm sorry I'm, i don't know how to unmute but let's see if uh yes sagar you can until they unmute you probably you can type your questions here uh we now
But it's allowed to talk here. Let me try this. Hey, uh, Sagar, can you see if you're able to? Yeah, are you able to hear me now? Yes, Sagar. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, uh, thank you so much for the session. It was very yeah. informative. Yeah, welcome. I was just about, yeah, I'm just, I was just about to ask, uh, see, this classification is done and we have stored our model and we have a, a ready-made code. We are providing that how to consume the model to the end user, right? But the end user doesn't know uh, the uh, prerequisites or the augmentation on the image we did right so we yes. did something like we, we flipped the image or we yes. fixed the pixel something like that yeah. so when i send the new images i probably i'm not aware that uh, what kind of augmentation the uh, researcher has done before uh -huh. even feeding the data to the training set right yes so he has to know it to do the same kind of augmentation before even testing his images or yeah. getting the output uh -huh. So that is what my question is like, uh, does he have to know by checking with the researcher or uh, is there a method something like he can get to know that, okay, you, this is, this is the prerequisite before feeding your image before consuming the model. So okay. you have to know it that you need to do such things before actually getting the output. So can we do something in that lines to automate or give a feedback to the end user that, uh, Hey, this is the model, but you cannot directly consume it. You, you have to do some prerequisite before consuming it. Yeah. See, uh, that kind of automation can be done, but actually making the user do the work will, uh, I mean, lead to confusion until he's a researcher and he's ripping up your code and GitHub and then going and understanding things. So if you want to make sure that you're exposing it just as an API, then probably what you can do is you can implement all the transformations, what the image has to go through, like whatever, like flipping, rotating and all inside the predict function itself. So when the image comes in, you do, uh, I mean, you do a, a flip and uh, rotate, rotate or whatever, and then uh, you kind of pass it on uh, down the line so that it predicts on the transformed images rather than the raw images. And probably in your documentation, you can write that these are the kind of transformations that are going inside the code. So it, it depends upon how do you how you want to have your kind of contract between your user or who is your end user. So if, you're, if you want to make sure your end user uses this like a dumb API and doesn't worry much, probably you can implement the flipping and rotation code here. So like I have done yeah, okay. like I resizing would. code, yeah, I put yeah. a simple resizing code here. So you can do all the transformation within this predict function. Yeah. Got it. So it will be a cache statement, right? If yes. the image is already done using such augmentation technique, then no need yes. to do. Otherwise, you have to. Yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Welcome. So, uh, anybody else have any question? Mm. Yeah. So, uh, anybody has any more questions, please do ask, please sign up for our, uh, OCI cloud console and use all the services, explore and experiment. And also there is a PyDay quiz that is going on. Please participate in that and uh, like win some uh, great goodies. So I'll just be here waiting for any more questions. There's just one more Avinas. Uh, whenever anything is available inside uh, the collection of data sets that we got, uh, mm -hmm. it's 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 it has satisfied all the compliance requirement be it uh, pci dss or HIPAA or anything exactly, like that. It, it exactly. Has already exactly so that is the biggest advantage when you download a data sets from here because everything has been vetted through a lot of uh, processes and then things are uploaded here so that users can focus on what they want to do build models or use this data for visualizations or anything rest of the things is taken care by oracle open data and it is hosted for free you can even download data without even logging to our console so what oracle open data uh, promises is people don't even have to provide any username or authentication information they can download everything for free
Okay, thank you. So, Vinash, uh, there is a question from uh, yeah. Ajram Dali. Um, uh, okay. To get the uh, location of the GitHub. Yes, I think uh, at the end of the session, uh, we will uh, share that with uh, everyone. I think probably they're going to send out a mails. And this uh, a link to quiz as well. Uh, probably Jane can provide the link to the quiz. Uh, can you ping Jane? Uh, uh, Jane is going to provide you the link uh, to the final quiz. So, so we have uh, ten more minutes. If you uh, for more Q and A, if people have any, I think uh, uh, I got the quiz link. Um, ah, awesome! You can share it here. Okay. I just okay. Check. okay yeah i think uh, the participants can use this link oh okay. yes yes agar yeah the recording of this uh, okay. session would be uh, the uh, link of the session recording would be uh, shared by the organizers to everyone who have uh, logged in and registered for it.